You are about to enter the Shockwave Skull Sessions podcast on ShockwaveSkullSessions.com. And now your host, Bob Nalbandian. All right, Shockwave Skull Sessions, I believe this is episode number 69. If that's not correct, I'm sure Matt will correct me on that. And boy, do we have a great one for you. You know, I had mentioned that one of the fan favorite segments is when we go through the band catalog with the artist. Of course, we have done this in the past Shockwave Skull sessions uh, with Bill Ward from Black Sabbath, going through the whole Sabbath catalog with Bob Daisley, going through his whole catalog with Rainbow Uriah Heap, Ozzy Osbourne, Widowmaker, and we did one fairly recently with uh, Manny Charlton from Nazareth. And uh, usually we have my good friend Monty Connor on these segments, and Monty joins us once again on this segment. Of course, Monty Connor, the VP from Nuclear Blast and longtime A&R man from Roadrunner Records. We also have newcomer, Mr. Andy Leff. Many of you may know he is the manager or was the manager for Porcupine Tree, also Living Color, and I believe King Crimson as well at one time. And the main guest of this podcast is none other than Joe Bouchard, original founding bass player for the band Blue Oyster Cult. It's a long one here, so we're going to get right into it. This is Joe Bouchard, along with Monty Connor, Andy Leff, and myself on this Blue Oyster Cult podcast. Uh, Andy, uh, meet Joe Bouchard. Hey, Joe, how are you? You and I, you and I met backstage at the Palace Theater in Albany 42 years ago. <laughs> oh, my God. God. That was a great show. I remember. I love wow. upstate. Yeah. From upstate, so, uh, you know, it was always good to get back to my yeah. roots. Yeah, so a lot of a lot of show, a lot of a lot of shows with you guys at the palace. Great, great wow. place. I kind of explained to Joe uh, what we're gonna do. We're just gonna basically go through the old uh, uh, BOC catalog, and you could ask Joe any questions about the recording process, the writing process of the songs, and uh, uh, it'll just be a fun podcast. And then, of course, we'll talk about his a uh, new project uh, at the end. But um, I, I guess we'll start from the beginning. Uh, for, for one of the Shockwave Skull Sessions, we got the great Joe Bouchard from Blue Oyster Cult, the original founding hey. bass player. How are you, my friend? I'm great. Fantastic. All right. And also on this podcast, we got returning guest, of course, Monty Connor from Nuclear Blast. What's up, Monty? How you doing? This is crazy exciting because I'm like one of the biggest Blue Oyster Cult fans on Earth, surpassed possibly only by Andy Leff himself. <laughs> so uh, it's pretty intimidating. It's pretty intimidating to be on a phone with Andy, who's like the ultimate supreme uh, BOC champion, but also he, he Joe from the band. Uh, <laughs> well, hey, I've done these before with you, Bob. We did Manny Charlton and we did Bill Ward, Bill but Ward. I don't know. I'm yeah. just more nervous this time. I've, maybe just because I love the band so much. So I don't want to get anything yeah. wrong. Well, I guess I should be intimidated because I'm sure I know the least about the band. And of course, our third guest is Andy Leff. Uh, Andy, first time on on the Skull Sessions. We've been uh, on an uh, email thread together on the uh, the infamous Monty thread. And uh, of course, you manage a Porcupine Tree and have been in the business uh, uh, quite a few years. Just so the listeners get a little uh, background about you, you want to give a, a brief little bio? Yep, uh, been in the was in the music business for twenty years. Managed a lot of bands: uh, Porcupine Tree, Stephen Wilson, King Crimson, Living Color. Uh, then became an agent for a couple of years, um, and now I am an associate professor of music industry studies at the University of Southern California. Wow! All right. Oh, so you're Radicali- radi- radi- radicalizing the next generation of music industry insiders to tear it all down and fix it up. So you're here in cool. California, huh? I am. Oh, okay, great. I thought oh, you were you also East Coast. All right. Well, great. <laughs> uh, before we get into the catalog, I know Joe. You you actually, uh, uh, of course, your brother was in the band during the. the uh, I, be- I believe the band started what sixty seven with Soft White Underbelly, and you came in yes, right that's correct right before nineteen seventy. The- 1970. 1970. Yes. Um, I was in the band for one year, and then we auditioned for Clive Davis at Columbia, and a miracle, he signed us. He's, uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know why, because <laughs> we weren't really like anything that he usually liked at, at, at that time uh, or since, but... Uh, yeah, it worked out. And so uh, I was just out, fresh out of college, 
And, uh, you know, I said to the guys, let's be rock stars and it worked out. I, I, I don't know how, but it did. So this was actually, I mean, you were really one of the first, uh, I mean, you know, there were, there were Dust and a few other bands, but you were prior to Aerosmith and Kiss and all that. A lot of people, you know, clump you in with that. But this was actually a few years prior to them before they really hit the scene, the club scene. Correct? Yeah. yeah. Well, we, you know, uh, we sort of took our cue from, uh, you know, Zeppelin and, and Black Sabbath. They were, you know, around then. Uh, but, you know, I was a big fan of Soft White Underbelly, but it was that sort of West Coast laid back hippie music, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, our manager, Sandy Perlman, said, you know, you, you, you got to like, you know, modernize your sound. And he thought that the next big thing coming was going to be this hard rock, heavy metal stuff. So uh, I think he was right. And uh, so we sort of played right into that. And I was uh, I was the new guy in the band, but uh, I, I enjoyed everything we did. It was uh, it was a great run. And uh, I was so excited making that first album. I couldn't believe it. It was cosmic. Well, let's let's get into that first album released in January of 72, the self-titled Blue Oyster Cult. When I joined the band, it was called A Stalk Forest. It was sort of an interim name. It wasn't working out with Soft White Underbelly. I was the new guy in the band. And then when we, we did the audition for Columbia, we had to come up with a name. We didn't have a name to put on the contract. And we wanted something fresh and... uh Sandy invented the name Blue Oyster Cult. And uh, I was shocked. I said, oh, my God, we're going to be what? (laughs) We're going to be what? (laughs) But we were wasting so much time arguing about a name. We really had to practice. We had to really rehearse our song. And uh, he said Blue Oyster Cult. And I said, okay. And then the next day he said, the people at Columbia, they love it. The uh, advertising people. We're just excited about having a band called Blue Oyster Cult. So I guess, you know, it's worked out. It's certainly distinctive. And um, yeah. oh, so you must have been asked okay. endlessly over the years, probably so many times right from the beginning, people asked you what a Blue Oyster Cult was. Um, and actually, I don't think, a, you know, I don't think a Blue Oyster Cult was ever really even pictured until the Fire of Unknown Origin record, right? That's Where it true. actually like showed a blue, what a Blue Oyster Cult might look like, but... You must have got asked that all the time at the beginning, right? Like what the name meant? Yeah, yeah. and we would just say, uh, it just is what it is, you know. I found yeah. out years later, I mean, after I left the band, that the name Blue Oyster Cult was the name for aliens who came from other worlds to Earth to change the, the course of history. Wow. Sandy wow. was of yeah. those historical things. Imagine you know, those. Yeah. <laughs> The Blue Oyster Cult would come to Earth at certain important uh, junctures in history and change the course of history. So, so okay, I'll buy that. And of course, that uh, album had, uh, which, which became a, a legendary song for the band, uh, "Cities of Flame" with rock and roll. Yeah. What what is a story? There's there's I, I believe uh, from Martin Popoff's book, he actually talks about that. Uh, Either Sandy Perlman or, or someone within the business wanted you guys to sound like Black Sabbath because Black Sabbath had just hit with their debut. Yeah. And the song The Wizard yeah. had a similar riff. Yeah. Is, is there a truth similar to that? Feel. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, it started as a different song. I think it was called Siren Sing Along or something. And um, I remember we were out on tour and I'd be, we were sitting out in a park and Albert was saying, no, it's it's got to be. Da da down. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, what happens after that? And then Donald Buck Dharma brought his uh, his uh, expertise to the song, and then Sandy had this lyric called uh, I don't know exactly what the lyric was, but one of the lines in the lyric was "Cities on Flame with Rock and Roll," and then they they saw that and said, "Ah, this is it. This is what it should be." To me, it's always been that sort of let's change the style of music. You're going to have, it's got a little rock and roll, but it's got metal in it too. So you have those two styles colliding in that song. It's, it's great. 
Andy, what were your Love thoughts uh, on, on that oh. debut? Uh, well, I, I mean, it's, it's a, you know, it's a stone cold classic. One of the things I wanted to ask Joe was, did you guys as a band make a conscious decision early on that you were going to have, you know, Sandy and Richard Meltzer, that you guys were going to have outside lyrics? Uh, outside lyricists, because not a lot of bands were doing that at the time. And I also noticed that when it comes to your songs, I mean, even on that first album, Screams, you have a, a sole writing credit on that. Were you yeah. always writing your own lyrics? Uh, not really. That was just a, a a sketch I had in a notebook, really rough, rough sketch. I, I still don't think the song is finished. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> One of these days I'll finish that song. No. I talk about that song a lot, and I'm glad that people still think of it fondly. Uh, it does have a mood to it that really kind of fit the album. And, um, yeah, that's what they liked about it. They liked the mood of that song. And, yeah, well, uh, hey, they put it in a pole position. You know, back then, when it came time yeah. to sequencing records, it was like, you know, you always put the best song opening the record, and then yeah. Yeah. whatever opened side two was so side important. Side two and the fact really that important. Yeah, yeah that the fact that they opened it with screams right away shows you that it was a band that uh, a song that the band regarded highly yeah. at the time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that record's incredible. I just love the heaviness of the production, like the 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 tones. That the, you know, it's a very dark record, especially compared to Tyranny and Mutation. Like sonically, Tyranny and Mutation yeah. has so much more treble and brightness to it. But I think the darkness of the production and the mix really just adds to the mystery and. I know we mentioned Black Sabbath before, but I very much look at the first three Blue Oyster Cult records in the same way I look at the first four Black Sabbath records. They're just a body of work that all fits together. Um, you know, the fact that all of the album covers are black and white, it just all kind of forms this chapter. Um, but, you know, the band had, you know, the band had a lot of heaviness to it, but it had so much more to offer than a band like Sabbath. I mean, as Andy mentioned before, you know, you had outside songwriters, which was very uncommon back then. Yeah. You had basically everybody in the band writing, ev almost everybody in the band singing. It was just such an yeah. intellectual form of heavy metal compared to anything else at the time. Well, it really we, sings as well. We didn't really have a plan, uh, like, let's get outside writers. It just happened that Sandy and his friend Richard Meltzer were a part of the team. And, uh, you know, we eventually we brought in Patty Smith and David Roeder and Helen Wheels and a few others. But I thought that the, the, a lot of the strength of that early era was we had a real team that was like, you know, going in all different directions, but still focused. And also, we didn't have time to really think about, you know, over overthink it. We were in right. such, you know, ru rush between playing gigs and going out on tour and that when we recorded it was done really quickly and maybe that's a good thing <laughs> you know it's funny i never even thought about it too but even the band's name blue oyster cult like the cult part of the name just kind of you know also kind of speaks to this team of people it was it wasn't just like right. the five band guys but it was a support system a cult yeah. around the band but i never even like made that thought about it that way oh, yeah. but that kind of makes yeah, sense I, I think about that a lot you know um, mm -hmm. it was, it was fun. You know, there, there was always something good lying around somewhere with a pile of lyrics on the piano in the practice room. They would, they would just be there. Any, anybody could pick up a lyric or, you know, or throw around riffs and, and there was a lot of jam and a lot of long jams. I'm saying we worked fast, but we jammed slow. <laughs> right, right. That was interesting about the band. You really combined the hard rock element with, as you see, the jamming element and this progressive element. And not too many before a lot of you know bands that were coming out of England. Then you know the ELPs, Genesis, Yes, you know they had that real progressive sound. And you combined that into this this hard rock fusion, which was which was de definitely quite different than you know the British bands yeah. around. Yeah, yeah. Was was that yeah. intentional or? Oh, I think so. Um, you know, the the guys definitely had a lot of uh, uh, artistic um, opinions. Alan Lanier probably wrote the fewest amount of songs, but he had a lot of influence on the rest of us. You know, if we were doing something that was just stupid, he would he would call us out in a minute. You know, <laughs> you know, and uh, so he his his aesthetic really had a lot to do with 
how those those records sound. All right. Andy, did you have any other comments regarding the debut? Uh, regarding the debut, no. I, I just, I, I mean, we could spend all day talking about each of these albums for hours <laughs> at a time, and I'm just afraid that if I start start going off on it, it's just going to, uh, you know, bog us down. So maybe we we need to move on to Tyranny. Yeah, let's do it. Tyranny yeah. and Mutation, uh, uh, released in May of 1973. Joe, why don't you talk about the, that uh, second release? Oh, that was a great one. I mean, uh, I kind of missed. The first one we did at uh, David Lucas's Jingle Studio, which was very basic, but really worked well. Uh, the second one we did at Columbia Records, I think it was on 52nd Street. And it was kind of corporate, you know, but but we uh, we rocked hard on that record. I think I think Sandy and his co-producer, Murray Krugman, wanted even more metal than the first. So, uh, you know, it was a fun album to put together. Joe, you had uh, a lot of you had a lot of writing on that on that album. You know, your signature song, or what a lot of people think is your signature song for the band Hot Rails to Hell. But uh, you also, yeah. you know, co-wrote Diz Busters, Wings Wetted Down, OD'd on Life Itself. It seemed that everybody was really stepping up in the writing in the writing at that point. Yeah, we were we we really were uh, very uh, pressured to get the album done quick. And and it's not like the first album. You, first album, you have a couple of years to work on the material. The second album, you're you're touring all the time, and you just have to slam it out as quick as possible. So there were there were a lot of good uh, good uh, ideas on that album. I'm, I just got lucky with Hot Rails to Hell. It has sort of lived for forty some years, and I and I'm I'm still still thinking I should finish that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, I could tell you that one you can't change. We were yes. rehearsing that song out on our uh, our house, our band house, and Sandy Perlman came in and he said, "Wow, that sounds like Hot Rods to Hell," you know. And I said, "Well, it doesn't have a name. I know we'll call it Hot Rails to Hell." So that was <laughs> that was Sandy's uh, <laughs> contribution to that song, uncredited, That's... but he is responsible for the. The title. So based on the movie Hot Rods to Hell, right? Yes. All, yes. yes. Great movie. An old, old movie. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right on. With all well, kinds of mayhem. I definitely look at that record as a significant step up from the debut, both sonically and songwriting wise. And I can just tell you, being an A&R guy and working in the music business, the second records are always the killers. You know, you have the whole sophomore yeah. slump thing, which... So many bands fall victim to that, and I always say that when a band delivers a second record that's even better than their first, it's usually a sign of a long career because so often bands fail on the second record. Sometimes they come back on the third, but usually well, when you see a band deliver a monster second record, it's the sign of long life that they're going to make it in the long run because, as you said, Joe, you have your whole life, the cliche, of course, yeah. you have your whole life to write the first record, but yeah. there's so much pressure on you on the second record, and everybody's waiting for it, and everybody's watching. You know, when you're making yeah. the first record, nobody cares, no one's bothering you, you're left to your own devices, yeah. and the second right. record, all of a sudden, there's expectations, and there's people waiting for it, and, and there's going to, you know, everybody's, it's just such a tough situation for a band to be in, and, it, you know, the second albums are really the records that always separate the men from the boys. Well, this is where the, the writing team, you know, the conce conceptual writing team comes in. Because if somebody's, you know, blown out, worn, worn out from whatever they're doing, other people will pick up the slack. And I, I just, I was very happy to jump in wherever I could, you know. Not all, everything I wrote was accepted, but, you know, uh, we did the best we could. Andy, was there anything else you wanted to add about uh, this album? Uh, well, again, just you know, just to go back to the whole writing side, it's it's interesting because this is the the album with the the two sides, the red and the black, right? Yeah, right. the so red that's side like and black another side. Another conscious decision. Yeah, the red side and the black side. Right, and so I thought that was just like another, you know, going back to what Monty was saying about bringing a more intellectual approach to to the genre is that you actually like put some thought into the the concept of of the sides itself, which is something that people hadn't really done prior to that time, and it may seem like a you know a small thing but it always stood out to me as a kid listening to it that there was like yeah. the red side and the black side yeah that would hey did that did, the, did that come after the song the red and the black or before 
Uh, that idea. Probably about the same time. Probably about right. the same time. Just right. thinking about, you know, how 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 we want this to uh, be seen by the public, you know? God, what was the song on this record that was a rewrite of, uh, uh, had the same riff as I'm on a lamb, but I ain't no sheep? Yeah. Which song yes, was? that was Red and the Black. Right, Red okay. Black. Now, I guess my question for you is, did, was that like an attempt to rewrite that song? Like, in other words, were you seeing it differently and wanted to kind of get another a second chance at that song? Was that the yeah, reason? Yeah, it, it had it had developed in the studio. Um, it was kind of like one of those hippie songs. It's all about you know taking off to Canada to avoid the draft. And right. um, then what, when we we developed this sort of you know da 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 da, and it was like whoa, this is we want more of that. So right. we just rewrote the song uh, with, with the same lyrics and made it the red and the black with a heavier riff. And also at that time, we were doing all these tours and we needed more material that would, you know, explode off the stage. Literally, you know, uh, not not just sort of, while, you know, while away the sound. Because, you know, the PA systems weren't very good. You had to just slam it out there. And make it right, make right. it exciting as much as you could. Right. All right. Should we? So, hey, yeah. Look, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Bob. Oh no, no, no. Continue on. I was just seeing you know, if you want to. Move oh no, on. no. I was just saying it was. I just love how you got a second shot at that song to do it like the way you had envisioned it later. I thought that yeah. was brilliant. It was a you know it's just a fun little Easter egg for fans too to kind of have a different yeah. version. Um, yeah. Hey, before we go on to secret treaties, just quickly, what is what's a disbuster? I'm dying to know. Oh, <laughs> well, uh, I I think that that was something that Richard Meltzer made up uh, <laughs> regarding a, a man's private parts. Oh shit! Okay, <laughs> is that something commonly known? And I'm just like, and I'm I'm in the dark, or you know, the, these guys would make up words all the time. They had they had their own way of talking to each other, like another language, and that was one of them. Uh, that right. was that was fun. I I remember we had this Hammond organ in our living room, and I had the lyrics for a couple of weeks, so I was kind of like playing around with the lyrics. But just yeah. one morning, I went down and started playing the riff on the organ, and that, and then I threw together some of the chords. Then everybody else piled on the song too. Uh, because it really was like a sort of tour de force live uh, extravaganza, lots of uh, craziness in that song. So I enjoy that song a lot. There's a great live version of it too. All right. Well, let's let's move on to Secret Treaties, uh, released April 1974. And of course, this uh, by now a lot of the American hard rock and metal bands. You know, you had Kiss, Aerosmith. You know, Ted Nugent uh, solo on the scene. Um, talk a little bit about that uh, that third record, uh, Secret Treaties. I love it. I mean, uh, it's got astronomy on it, which yep. was a big song for me personally. But uh, it's a good good rocker. Flaming Telepaths, fantastic sound, and great sounds on that one. Harvester of Eyes, they're all good. Uh, ME-262 was, I mean, you know, it's been interpreted probably mm -hmm. in 80 different ways, but it was Sandy's lyric, and I think it, it sort of uh, was a, a very interesting, nobody had done a song like that ever. And then Dominance of Submission, oh my God. <laughs> what craziness! Great song. What, what you can do with that? Oh my God! Yeah. I have to say, I think Emmy two sixty two. If someone put a gun to my head and said, "Name your favorite BOC song," as hard as it would be to do, I would have to say it's probably Emmy two sixty two. It's just such a bizarre song in every direction. Even the vocals, the the part that's called, you know, the do 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 that part. Like, you know, it's hard to even hear at first. Is it a keyboard doing it? Is it voices? Of course, you know, no, I know it's voices. Real voices. That's real Yeah, voices. no, I knew that later because I could hear that, that it's done that way live. But like that, yeah. those voices, it's just so bizarre. Everything about that song is just completely unique and never before done by anyone. Um, well, one, one of the great things about that recording is we did it at Columbia's 30th Street Studio. We, we didn't know the history of that place. But that's where Miles Davis recorded Kind of Blue. That's where Stravinsky recorded uh, his operas. It was like 
they had the greatest, it was a huge studio. And uh, we knew we had to make a better record than the previous one. I mean, we say that all the time. But uh, I think the influence of that studio, and I, I've been studying, you know, all the uh, amazing people that recorded there. And unfortunately, it, it they had to shut it down because we made too much noise for the condos next door. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sad, well, but great place. The Sonics are great on the record, too. To me, it's like it's got that sickness of the first record and the clarity of the second. But it's just all around like the most, to me, the better, the best produced of the first three. And I know that. Most fans, hands down, consider it to be the band's greatest work. I know it's probably Andy Left's favorite record of all time. Um, Andy, I'm surprised you're not just talking more about this one because I know I'm you just worship this record. I'm, try, I'm, I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be. Uh, you know, when it comes to secret treaties, I could I could talk all day about it because it is one of the greatest rock albums of all time. I, I mean. Just in terms of what is done in the 38 minutes and 14 seconds of that album, it's just nonstop riffage, just riff after riff after riff. And, you know, I don't even I don't even consider it. I, I mean, I know there's eight songs on the album, but I consider it a whole piece. You know, one of the reasons is because all the songs flow into each other. But it is it is just it is the most unrelenting riff heavy uh, and there's just never a dull moment. That album never gives up. There's not a weak passage or a weak moment on that album. And um, I mean, I guess one of the questions I have for Joe is that was it a conscious decision to, to put all of those songs together so that it really never stopped, that the, all the songs went into each of the other ones? Well, it's that kind of Beatle thing where you medleyed up the songs. Uh, we hadn't, uh, you know, we wanted to give the impression of a, co you know, of a cohesive recording from start to finish. Uh, I love the little sound effects they put in the, the right. music box uh, you know uh, the uh, synthesizer we it was some kind of weird uh, crude synthesizer in those days but i don't know i don't know it it, it 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 just worked out good we spent a little bit more time on this than the first two and uh well people still talk about it i'm i'm very happy all right. Yeah, no, it's just, I, I mean, uh, among all the, the, the albums I have, I, I just, when people say, like, what is the best hard rock album of all time, I, I instantly go to Secret Trees. It's just a, ma it's just a masterpiece. It's just amazing. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's quite an endorsement yeah. there. <laughs> well, no, I know, yeah. Andy, I know how you feel. That's why I wanted you to go on about this record, because I just, I know how important it is to you. And I agree with everything I, I, Andy I, I said. Can, I can go <laughs> could go on and on and you know and the economy of that album too is uh, that's just another thing people don't remember in this day and age you know once we got to the cd era and people were putting out 78 minute albums and all sorts of you know filler and all that is that the economy of that album is just is just amazing to me is that uh, you know as i said there's not a, a moment on that album that lets up it is just one riff once you get through one riff there's another one and another one and another one and it just doesn't stop until the very, you know, until astronomy fades out at the end. Yes. Just amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. is universally uh, considered one of the, the greatest uh, underground, underrated hard rock uh, metal albums. Uh, what, did that get much traction? Did any of the songs get any traction radio-wise or commercially? No, the Career of Evil was the single, mm -hmm. but I think it was not destined to make it to the top ten and compete with... Uh, Sure. TV Wonder, <laughs> you know, uh, the pop singers of the day was not going to compete in that area, but that's okay. Right. It's okay. It's, uh, hey, that song sums the band up. You guys made a career in evil. I mean, that's, evil. that's yeah. right there. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and Patty and did, what a and Patty it eventually did year. go gold. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I yeah. think seven times. I'm not, I'm not in front of my computer, but I think it actually went seven times gold wow. uh, overall. So. Even though it didn't have Good. a hit single uh, necessarily, people knew what it was. No. Money will know. Mon Andy, you're wrong on that one because I'm looking. I have a book in front of me. Joel Whitburn's top pop albums, 90, uh, you know, that lists every record and its certification. And um, according to this, the record's just gold once. Oh, okay. Listen, yeah. even 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 that's very impressive for a song that had no well, radio play. Mm. For an album that I like had no radio play, it went seven times gold. <laughs> <laughs> 
And Interestingly enough, <laughs> according to this, um, the only platinum records at least certified in this book were Agents and Some Enchanted Evening. Oh, yeah, weird. The some, power, a live record? The power platinum? of the Reaper. Yeah. Oh, actually, well, I guess Reaper I'll, was I'll, on I'll, Some Enchanted I'll, Evening. Yeah. I, think, I think there might be another one somewhere. Yeah. Hey, Monty. Well, yeah, this book is from... Monty, I, just went, I just went on with... I just went on Wikipedia, and I don't. Maybe that's where I got the idea. It does say gold seven times for secret treaties, so I'm not sure. Oh, that's so weird because this book is, is this book goes up to 2016. But hey, you know we RIAA site would, would tell you. Listen, all the reissues and maybe all the reissues and versions of that album I bought the quad reissue, the bonus tracks reissue, the box yeah. set reissue. Maybe it's just, maybe oh. it's me that made it that gold. But I love the bonus. I love the tracks that didn't make it on that record, like Borman the Chauffeur and uh, oh, yeah, Borman the Chauffeur. That's Joe's song, I think. <laughs> and that song, yeah, you know what? I actually, oh. Joe, I heard that track years before it got put on the reissue because, as you know, I know your brother Albert because he produced yeah. a band for Roadrunner, and yeah. one that and what you know, this was like back in '91, and Joe made uh, Al made me a cassette of like all this rare BOC stuff that hadn't been on record, so. Borman oh, yeah. and Sherpa was on that cassette, so I had that for like a good ten years or so before it actually came out on the remaster. Wow! Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had that great that, track. People love that track, but you know we had lots of good stuff, so something had to go. And yeah, that was the thing yeah. with albums back then. You had limitations, usually like only eight, eight or eight or nine songs, especially if you yes. had long songs on that record. Yeah, ten minutes aside maximum. Otherwise, you lost Sonics and yeah, you'd start. Really distorting. Well, That's should we move on to the uh, live album on your feet and on your knees, or on your feet or yeah. on your knees? <laughs> uh, what, what's uh, what's your memories about that live album? Uh, do, you, do you remember much about that Joe, that concert, or was it from multiple it concerts? Was done, it was done really live. Mm. Uh, I there, I don't think there's any overdubs at all. Uh, I love what Jack Douglas did with the mixing. Uh, I think it's a fantastic sounding live record. Just it just has a lot of excitement in the grooves, and that's that's what you want a live record to do. Yeah, it, it, it's it's all good. And that album, uh, that album shows you know that the the great thing about that album is it shows a completely other side of the band too, because you really stretched out a lot of those songs, especially some of the Secret Treaty songs. Like there's a really yeah. long Harvester of Eyes. Um, <laughs> Man. You know, there's a whole bunch of songs that are really stretched out with some ad living. The Diz Busters on that album is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I want to ask you, Joe, was because I know you know you obviously later released some some Enchanted Evening as, as a single live album uh, around that time when uh, On Your Knees came out. The double live album was you know of course you know the Kiss Alive, the Frampton Comes Alive. Was it um, was there any uh, pushback to do a, a single album, or were you insistent on doing a double live album, or? No, we, uh, Columbia was definitely, uh, enthusiastic about doing a, a double album. And, um, I think, I thought it worked good because it, we could, they, I think they priced it so that the fans, everybody who had seen our show, and there was a lot of them, would have that souvenir and get a, a really good idea of, you know, what they had seen. And, uh, the performances are really good. I love the bass sound. <laughs> it's all about the bass. <laughs> right. And wait, the album cover too is just so. To me, it's like oh. the most sinister of all Blue Oyster Cult covers. Is that cover? I was just going to say the same thing. Exactly. I was just going to say the same thing. It's yeah. just so perfect. And of course, we know. You know, I've covered it on Facebook. I copied you, Joe. You know, it's just like a church in the middle of no, you know, somewhere in Long Island. But it, you know, the cover just the it just really elevates that image, like the album, so much for Columbia me. Columbia um, had a really. This was Columbia Art Department, and they had right. some really talented people there. And they, they just loved, you know, having a concept that they could get behind. And uh, that, was, uh, that was done by Columbia Art Department. They did a beautiful job. Who came up with uh, the title On Your Feet or On Your Knees? I don't know. I think it was either Sandy or Murray Krugman. Probably Sandy. But, uh, um, yeah, that's kind of funny. <laughs> there was was I I'm pretty sure wasn't there a bonus track that came out a studio version of Bugs Boogie? Uh, yes. yes, later on. Uh, oh, yeah, so was, I guess that was a very early recording though. Much yeah, that was going to be my question. Did the studio version? I I assume the studio version of Bugs Boogie predated this live version. Uh, yeah, but we never had we never nailed it in the studio. I think it was going to be on uh, Journey and Mutation. Oh, okay. And uh, we we tried it a few times and. 
I think the producers said, no, nah, it's not as good as the the live thing. We we didn't right. have the energy, you know, in the studio. So the the first Bucks Boogie was on a bootleg that we did up in Rochester, New York, and it just happened to sound great, and it's classic. And it was an e- easy choice to put it on, on your feet or on your knees because that was always a, a big number in the live show. And, yeah. Um, but also, I know as a as a music consumer, and and you guys will all say the same thing because you all grew up buying records and loving music. And when you could buy a live record and it had songs on it that you were only hearing for the first time live, like you know, in this case, fans were hearing Bucks Boogie for the first time. They were hearing Born to Be Wild. I ain't got yeah. you. I always thought that was such a great way to like, you know, pad out a live record and make it interesting so that people just oh, weren't yeah. getting what they expected. Um, and and the. Uh, arrangements developed over our tours you know right. we would add little things to it and make it make, make it better some right. you know some bands would just go out and just do exact recreations of their hits but that wasn't what we did there was always uh let's change this around or you know make a new ending for this or you know yep that was good yep. it was a good time hey joe i want to ask Fun, you right? Uh, what what inspired the uh, Blue Oyster Cult symbol, the logo? Uh, was that based oh, off something? Okay. Yeah, well, um, I was told that it was the symbol for white lead, which alchemists used back in the Middle Ages to turn lead into gold. So it was also the symbol of chaos and heavy metal. And mm-hmm. I thought, ah, oh, come on, this is more stuff that Sandy Perlman made up. But when I was going to graduate school at the University of Hartford, I looked up in the library there where they have everything. I looked up a book of symbols, and there it was, the, the symbol for white lead. So it was developed by our, the guy who did our first covers. Um, yeah, Bill Golick. Bill Golick. Bill Golick. Yeah. And uh, he smoothed out the curve in the hook. The uh, the actual white lead has kind of a sharp hook, but uh, yeah, that's that's the real real thing, and that's where it came from. It was a great great marketing uh, uh, tool. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Was there yeah. controversy surrounding it at the time, though? Uh, I don't know. I mean, every even uh, bands like uh, Traffic had a great logo. You know, oh, right. I don't know. I, I I always thought of it as just. Well, that's our logo. All right. Well, sure. Should we move on to Agents of Fortune? 1976, sure. May of 1976, of course, had the huge hit, uh, Don't Fear the Reaper. Uh, this definitely must have been a game changer, especially for uh, for you as far as commercial success and radio success, uh, oh. uh, Joe. Well, first of all, I always believed in the song. We mm. had put out those other records, and I didn't feel like anything really had... The, the horses, as they say, the horses to be a big hit. When I heard the Reaper, D- Donald's cassette demo from his home studio, uh, I said, wow, if we're ever going to have a hit, this is it. And it's just because it it pulls in the, uh, the whole idea of Blue Oyster Cult, but it's also a love song. Right. You know, and there's a lot of suckers out there that love love songs. I love them. <laughs> and uh, I knew that we had to get that one right. You know, uh, I had no idea that it was going to take on this sort of uh, iconic status, you know, for for the band. But it it has. And everything else is very good on the album, too. There, you know, I don't know if there would any of the other songs could be singles. Maybe this ain't the summer of love. And that really just points to that song as being. Uh, a, a, a smash hit. It didn't hit until October. It came out, in, I think maybe April. Right. You know, it sort of percolated all summer. But once it got on the radio, started you know little radio stations here, Chicago picked it up, L.A. picked it up, Boston was playing it. It made all the difference in our touring. Mm. We we were playing to like half full houses you know, opening for other people. As soon as that became a hit, it was headline and sold out 
and packed houses wherever we went. I knew that it was going to make a major change in in the way we uh, we operated. You know, I look at that record. It wasn't just a commercial game changer for the band, but to me, it sounds like it, to me, it's a band that's completely reinvented themselves. Even you know, even without hearing the record, it's got a blue on the cover. Like even the cover art alone stands out and lets you know this is different from the first three. It's the start of a new chapter. So to me, it was just like the band rewriting all the rules, changing the game, and reinventing their whole sound. It sounds nothing to me like the first three records. It's just a, a completely new sound. Um, and it's funny because I appreciate this record so much more now as an adult than I did as a teenager. As a teenager, I loved the first three records. It wasn't me, rough enough. <laughs> yeah, I didn't really find this heavy enough. Like, enough you know, when I'm thir- yeah, when I'm 13 years old, I can't appreciate True Confessions. I can't appreciate Morning File, Morning Final, and Tenderloin and Debbie Denise. I was just lacking the heaviness, so I didn't love this record as a teenager. But now, as an adult, it's one of my favorite records. And as you guys know, the band, the current band, recently did a live version of the record, and just mm-hmm. watching that made me appreciate this record even more. I have like more love and appreciation for this record at the age of 56 than I did when I was 13. I can tell you that. Wow. And uh, mm-hmm. I just think and it's such a mature, amazing piece of work. It really is. And I actually just want to echo what Monty said, too, because I, was the, I had the exact same reaction. I, I, it wasn't rough enough for me, and you know, Reaper was so oversaturated. But now, at this point in my life, especially Side 2, which was kind of the lost side of that album. Oh, yeah. I really, yeah. really like, you know, Morning Final and Sinful Love, Tattoo Vampire, Tenderloin, all of those songs, um, which weren't, you know, considered hits or anything of that kind of lost song, really stand out now. Uh, now, just their artistry, the writing and the recording of them sound great. Absolutely. Well, we had a new studio. And, which and Morning Final. And Morning Final is my favorite song on the album, though. Oh, well, thanks. Thanks. That was a lo- lot of fun. I played piano on that. And Alan Lanier played bass and uh, basically did the track live in the studio. A few few overdubs, but it was, it was pretty much live in the studio. Yeah, I, 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 I'm glad you like that. Yeah. Hey, it took us all these. It took the. It took us all these years to finally like be mature enough to appreciate. I, 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 didn't, I didn't play that song for thirty years because I I never had a piano. Now I can play it on acoustic guitar, and I think it really works. But it took me a while to get into it too. <laughs> hey, Joe, who wrote the riff? The riff to ETI is one of my favorite fucking riffs of all time. I could hear that thing on loop twenty four hours and never get tired of that riff. That's a Buck Dharma riff. Oh, my he a, God. <laughs> he had a great song written there, but the lyrics were not really Blue Oyster Cult enough. So um, Sandy came in and said, we should do this uh, this uh, extraterrestrial song. And uh, I guess Donald agreed. I don't I don't know if I... I'm, I might have his original demo of the track, but it certainly is a great riff. It's fantastic. Oh, my riff. God. Yeah, and see, I don't even think the song's nailed on this record. I like the version on Some Enchanted Evening. To me, that is the, like, that's oh, yeah. what I go to for that song, not this version on this record. We added just, a little you know, uh, coda to the song. That's, a, that's where, we, where we work things out. Because the ending, you can't just fade out when you're doing a live show. Yeah, yeah. So we definitely worked on that, came up with some new bits, and it became very uh, satisfying to play. Yeah, it's just, you know, when you guys played it live, it was so much heavier and more raw. And, you know, the production on the album version is just a little swampy, a little mushy. It doesn't have that toughness that it has on Some Enchanted Evening. And I would say the same thing about a song like Dr. Music. Like, that was so powerful, so killer live, not as good as on Mirrors. You know, like, yeah. you guys were a band that occasionally, like, the, the, actually often the the live versions became the definitive versions on many of the songs. Yeah, yeah. I would love to remix that, but we'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you, John. You, you guys always had a great sense of humor. That the movie Stoned Age had a great yes. scene, live scene of, uh, uh, of course, you guys performing uh, "Don't Fear the Reaper" live, and the laser beam going through the eyes, and the whole thing yes. about the love song. Oh, that's a pussy song. And uh, did you uh, uh, work with the uh, director uh, on that prior to that? I was uh, I when that it. came out. I was I had been out of the band uh, for a few years, okay. and uh, I was just as surprised as everybody else when it came out. You know, 
Uh, I wish we had gotten more songs in movies. Um, we got lucky with a couple of things, but uh, and now of course Reaper's been in every other movie out there. Sure, uh, but no, about seventy-five movies and TV shows for the Reaper. Wow! But uh, well. I wish wish we had more um, because that that's always fun. You know, to have. So uh, what? What about when uh, the SNL skit for "Don't Fear the Reaper"? I, I mean, you guys must have that. been loving that so much. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, it makes me laugh. It still makes me laugh. And to be honest, the 90s was not a great decade for Blue Oyster Cult. The music, everything, everything, it was, nothing was like Blue Oyster Cult in the 90s, you know. It was either hip-hop or uh, grunge. And a whole generation grew up without knowing who Blue Oyster Cult was. But when the cowbell thing came along, it's like, Oh, there is this band. And then they listen to that song and that gets them into listening other tracks on the album. And uh, I, I tell you, we could, our, our catalog of songs couldn't be any bigger. It's far bigger than it was in the 70s. Wow. So, right. Uh, it's, yeah. it's almost like the Run DMC Aerosmith collaboration, like the way that just opened up a whole new generation to Aerosmith. You know, right. it was kind of the SNL skit was the same thing for BOC. It just like you know, opened up so and, many doors for you guys. And, and where did that come from? I don't know. A couple of stoned SNL writers <laughs> with the headphones on. <laughs> Listening to the CD. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It, it was good that it, that it opened up our uh, appeal to a whole younger generation. Yeah. Mm. And that's, hey, that's okay. You guys hear the version? Somebody put up on YouTube a version of Reaper, like, slow down to like where the song stretches out over 40 minutes. Oh, I love Did that. Ever, that it's, a, Paul, it's Paul stretch, they call it. Yeah. yeah, that thing's amazing. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's scary. It's scary. Yeah, it really it's is. Scary. <laughs> <laughs> you know, speaking of movies, Joe, there was another movie. I think it came out probably in the early 2000s. I don't know if you're familiar called Roadie, I believe was the title oh, yeah. about a Blue Oyster yeah. Cult Roadie. That was, it was kind of, I guess, a weird kind of, I guess, a dark comedy kind of movie, yeah. but uh, a, yeah. a, very I've cool. I've seen uh, actually, actually a couple of uh, extended uh, scenes that oh, wow. were cut out of the movie. They're really good. And a friend of mine did the uh, did the score for that movie. But, you know, and they were they were just big Blue Oyster Cult fans that, that wanted to make a, a movie and I, yeah, it was it was entertaining. I dig that movie. Have you seen that movie, Monty? I have, but not in so long, so I can't really talk about it. Just sort ages ago. Yeah, I don't remember much about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, sh- uh, should we move on or? Yeah, uh, Spectres, I, sure. Spectres, Spectres. Uh, 1977, October 77. Why don't you start that off, Joe? I I love this album. Uh, I I had some really nice uh, contributions. Celestial McQueen, Nosferatu. I think those are really strong. They were just written kind of uh, at the last minute because um, we had a, we were supposed to tour in Canada and it was canceled. So I came back home and both of those lyrics were like waiting for me from Helen Wheels. And uh, they came together really quick and they weren't supposed to be on the album, but they at the last uh, album was really great. strong. You know, Epic. Uh, Kind of epic, epic biker kind of epic, epic. Really Death emotional. Valley emotional. Yeah, ready to rock. Going through the Ian Hunter. And oh, I love the night. Oh and my I love god. The night. Oh yeah. My god. Oh yeah. I yeah, played that, that uh, at. Um, did, you did you guys, guys do, do that song with Albert? What was it? Andy and I were at. Yeah, the 40th anniversary of the Best Buy. Yeah. Oh my god. That was amazing. That's that could that that could be another Reaper. I think. But it's a fantastic song. You know. yeah, to me, to this, me this record, record is just very much, much you, know, you know, mature, you know, direction from Agents of Fortune. It's like the natural follow up to me. Um, but you guys, Joe, you must have felt, I assume you felt a lot of pressure to follow up Don't Fear the Reaper. Were you guys writing this record under a lot of pressure to, to have another radio uh, single? Yeah, I think not so much writing, but certainly production wise. You know, we got to make sure all the harmonies are just right. And, you know, maybe we second guessed a little bit. Probably it wasn't as big as agents because uh, there were there were. It's the old story. 
of the record company having a change in management. Right. And uh, they they said it. Well, it was going to be big, and 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 you know it's got it pushes all the right buttons, but you know just might be just uh, you know it's a matter of timing when you get the record out there, you know whether right. it's going to be thriller or <laughs> or nothing. Were you surprised <laughs> that Godzilla was the big hit on that album? Uh, I love that song. Great song. No, kind of... no, we 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 thought we thought it had a lot of um, potential. And uh, of course, it's it's a classic. Absolutely, it didn't go into the top twenty like Reaper did, but it did very well over the yeah. years. Yeah, hey, it's like, it's still it a hit. Well. You know, not a hit on the same level as Reaper, but it was a hit. So sure. I mean, the fact that you it guys huge. delivered another hit after like that was, I'm sure, yeah. made you guys feel amazing that you delivered. Yeah, I don't think anybody was disappointed with Spectres. Maybe at the time, maybe the sales were less from a record company perspective, but certainly yeah. out there in the world of fans, we all no no one was let down. We thought it was exactly what we wanted. Andy, what were yeah. your thoughts? And the first time the band appeared on the cover of an album. True. Yes. Ooh, this is a true. nice cover too. I like that cover. Wait, by the way, no, Joe, really, there are no. It really, it really evokes a mood that cover. Oh. Joe, I've looked for outtakes on this. There are no any. There's nothing that lives online that, with any type of alternate photos, that, that's the only photo that seems to exist from that shoot that's ever surfaced. There's one where we're standing up. There's one where we're standing up around the table. I've but that's that on the back one. cover. Is that the back cover? Oh, maybe it is. <laughs> yeah, I think it might be. Maybe. Uh, yeah. No, I've, I've I've seen a few uh, other outtakes, but they're Ooh, hard to if find. You, if I can Dan, find ever, something. It'll be coming your way. All right, you let me know because I'm always uh, I'm always searching. <laughs> love it, I love it. Somebody's got to do it. There you go. All right, should we move on to the uh, second live album, Some Enchanted Evening? Sure. Oh wait, I have a quick question before Joe talks about this one. Yeah. Um, how come it was a single? Is it could you know? Is it because it was coming so soon after the, the last double, and you're, you're like, okay, well, it was only like two albums ago. Let's do a single. Was that why? Yeah, yeah. Um, right. There, there was probably enough stuff, but we wanted to keep it a tight package. You know, I don't, I don't know. We, I don't think we discussed that aspect. Right. It was always planned to be a single album. Now, the nice thing about this is that we actually, it was a little more planned than uh, On Your Feet or On Your Knees. We actually went to, after every show, we'd go into the recording truck. We'd say, let's fix this. You know, that note you played there, fix that. Tomorrow night, and we would make a little adjustments in the thing so that we knew we could come up with a great live recording. I mean, it takes planning. You know, it's nice when it happens spontaneously, but that album is really planned out, and I think it sounds fantastic performances are great everybody was in a, a good groove on those those tracks no it was always planned to be a single album we got to get out of this place a lot of fun there the bass sounds great on that reaper is really uh and astronomy oh my god oh my god yeah. astronomy. <laughs> definitive <laughs> version of astronomy yeah definitive absolutely definitive. Well, wow. well, I love. I think, like I was saying before, I think the version on this record of ETI is the greatest version. I love. Are you ready to rock on this with the whole mm-hmm. ending? You know, with the rah rah part from Eric, and then uh, you know the, the keyboard solo. Like, I just think those two songs are really, really stepped up. And also, Joe, I know you were mentioning before really liking the mix on On Your Feet. I like this mix better. To me, it's just there's more sub low end in it. It's just son- much sonically richer to me than On Your Feet. More hi fi. Yeah. Um, but in a great way. Um, and also, I could be imagining this, but I think the hi-hats kind of mix loud on this record. Um, like, especially in Are You Ready to Rock, you really hear that hi-hat in a great way that's adding yeah. such energy to that song. Um, I just, yeah, I'd, I'd probably rate this even higher than On Your Feet or On Your Knees, is, although I think that's a little bit of heresy to most fans, but there's heresy. something about this record that I love. There, there's different kinds <laughs> of records. <laughs> you know. They're, they're, they're just totally different animals, I think. Yeah. Uh, which yeah. is okay. It's okay. I think we, we, we set out to do that, and I'm glad you like the sound, because we worked hard on making oh. sure that every sound was right where it should be on that one. Yeah, it's it's really an amazing... It, it just, it's such a great-sounding record, sonically. It just leaps out of the speakers at you. It's perfect. 
Great live album. It's interesting you did two uh, covers on that. Of course, MC5's Kick Out the Jams and uh, The Animals. We got to get out of this place. Kick Out the Jams. Yeah. Awesome. Great version. Great version. I, I agree. Um, Were those... We had been playing that okay. since the days of Soft White Underbelly. Oh, okay. We, we used to, it, it, because uh, Soft White Underbelly was on Electra, and uh, so was the MC5. Mm. So they had all these singles. <laughs> and they would like, they would just like mock them out. But we we used to we used to jam on that just for fun, way back in our earliest days. So it was it was sort of a nod back to when we were a starving band, all living in one house. Yeah, kick out the jam. <laughs> all right. Should uh, was there anything else you wanted to add, anyone, uh, before we move on to mirrors? Okay. Let's do it. Mirrors, nineteen seventy nine. Well, yeah, why don't you talk about that a little bit, Joe? Well, we we uh, made a big change there. We decided to use Tom Worman as the producer. And we lo- we love Cheap Trick, the, the records that Cheap Trick made. I loved working with Tom. He did, it was, there was sort of a personality rub with some other guys in the band, which I will not mention and their names. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, it took, it, and also we recorded in California which might, I don't know if that was good or bad where we were recording, but it, we were definitely, you know, a lot of pressure to make a commercial record here again. But, and also it sounded better in the studio than it, the final mix. So I think it should have been given a little bit more of that, you know, hard edge than it, it came out. But on the other hand, there's some good hard, Rock and songs, the I Am the Storm and the Vigil. And, yeah. and Dr. Music, the live version of Dr. Dr. Music. Dr. Music, yeah. yeah. Dr. Music was uh, kind of like, a, uh, I always thought of it as a Jay Giles song. And mm-hmm. I wanted Magic Dick to play harmonica on it. But we got Mickey Raphael instead. And Mickey is just incredible. He's known for his work with uh, Willie Nelson. A fantastic, really cool guy. Mm-hmm. And, Genya and Ellen Foley, Genya Ravon and Alan Foley saying background. It was like a dream come true, you know? So, yeah, I enjoyed that a lot. It's interesting uh, yeah. how you said you uh, uh, the band meant for that to be a, a more commercial album. And a lot of times when bands intend to write commercial songs, they just don't really make it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that album... Uh, never really got, uh, I don't believe any of the songs really got, at least on the West Coast, much uh, radio play. Was there any disappointment from the from the band and the record label that uh, it wasn't uh, as commercial a success as the last couple albums? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't think the record company was ex- is that excited about promoting the album. Another thing where there was, there was still, there was a lot of other things going on at the time. Maybe it was the wrong time, wrong time to put out a record like that. But, uh, we, you know, when we're doing it as, as good as we can, even before it was mixed, we had to go out and tour because there was still, you know, crazy demand for, uh, Blue Oyster Cult on tour. So, yeah, it might have been better. I don't know. We, we, uh, we interviewed with a few other producers and, uh, decided to go with Tom and, I thought it was pretty good. What I was going to say is, you know, I kind of compare this to Agents a little bit in terms of my reaction. I think as a teenager, I liked this less, even less. Like, it definitely was too light for me. And it really wasn't until I became an adult that I started to love this record because, you know, as an adult, you're not listening to it for whether it's heavy or not or whether, you know, it's got too many ballads or whatever. You just, as an adult, I'm listening to the song craft. And I'm appreciating something like ND and even Moon Crazy and just, I'm just into the strength of the writing. So that's a record that I've reappraised and I'm really into. I think most Blue Eyes Circle fans my age would say the same. And of course, our wacky friend Martin Popoff, he thinks it's the band's greatest work ever. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Do you know about that, Joe? You know, you know, like Martin's uh, hits. Yes, I've I've, I've, I've read that. It's, it's, uh, Hey, you know, um, Andy, what do you think? What's your appraisal? 
Well, you know, it's like uh, echoing what you said. It was, you know, this was the time when I was really, you know, I was, I guess I was 13 or 14 when this album came out. I already uh, seen the band a couple of times and uh, the album didn't, didn't get me because it just it didn't have that, the heaviness, but seeing those, a lot of those songs live change, you know, it's like what you were saying before, Monty, like Dr. Music on the album doesn't do anything for me at all, but seeing it live or seeing the energy that the band brought a lot of these songs live uh, really yeah. kind of changed my perspective. Yeah. Did you guys do a lot of the? I know you did quite a few uh, more on the East Coast, I guess, and I guess you did one of the day on the Greens. But you know, of course, uh, seventy eight, seventy nine. This was the the era of the big music festivals. You know, we had the Cal Jam and Texas you know, the Ke- Jam. Texas Jam. Yeah. Te- did you do many of those uh, uh, big festivals? A lot of them. Yeah. A lot of them. the Rose Bowl, I think. Oh really? Uh, oh, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. Wow. Oh, and the, up up the whole West Coast, there were several stadium things. I know you did a day on the green at the Oakland stadium. Yeah. Yeah. We did about four day on the green. They were amazing. Mm. Amazing. Well, was it real competitive, especially, you know, there's always these stories about, you know, uh, with Aerosmith and Ted Nugent and the fights and the egos and everything. uh, (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I always just, anytime you play a stadium, it's, it's a, it's a privilege and you feel so excited and you can't say, well, well, why would anybody not, you know, want to bum out this show? But I guess it does happen, you know. We did a lot of those shows, so there are a lot of people with different personalities. Right. <laughs> which were remain nameless. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, should we, should we move on to uh, Cultosaurus Erectus? Sure. All right. Sure. Uh, of course, uh, uh, released in 1980. Well, well, why don't you go ahead and talk about that, Joe? Well, this is the one that uh, we said we're not going to wimp out on this one. And so we got uh, Martin Birch, mm. well known for his work with Deep Purple, Machine Head. I love Machine Head. I, uh, I love those, you know, those, those albums he did with uh, Deep Purple. And so... He was an easy choice to get this one. So there's a lot more hard rock on this than either Mirrors or Agents or Spectres. And um, it was a lot of fun. Uh, he was a gas to work with. He's very low key in the studio. He lets uh, he would let us sort of flounder. And, you know, he wasn't one of these guys that said, you got to do it this, this way or that way. He just said, you just work it out. I'll let you know when it's ready to record. So we'd be like frantically trying to find, you know, the parts and put it all together. And then he would say, Oh, what was that? That was great. Let's take it. And so it was a lot of fun, you know, fantastic producer. In fact, he did, uh, Martin Birch produced the, uh, Black Sabbath, uh, Heaven and Hell that same year, Heaven and, and both of you guys did the infamous black and blue tour, black Sabbath, blue oyster yeah. cult tour. <laughs> It, it it made a lot of sense uh, business wise because uh, it was gonna it was the biggest tour of the year. Yeah, great it was, tour. It was fantastic. Yeah, it was the biggest tour of the year. Big numbers in every town. Sandy Perlman was managing Black Sabbath at that time. That's right. That's right. right. Yeah. yeah, and by the way, that's how Black Sabbath yeah. came to use Lynn Curley, who did the cover art of Agents of Fortune. Uh, must have been yeah. recommended to Black Sabbath by Sandy. Who did Heaven and Hell? <laughs> Absolutely, wow. yeah, yeah, uh, well, yeah. Heaven and Hell, Mob Rules, they're all good. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I got to say, as a teenager, I thought this record was a crushing return to form. I love the heaviness of it. Um, you know, maybe it wasn't as commercially successful. It didn't have hits or anything like you know, like the follow up record did with Burning for You. But I thought this record was one hundred percent satisfying. The bands. You know, the, the band standing in the hard rock world seemed to be reinvigorated. Um, the, the black and blue tour was huge. I, to me, it just felt like a great, great time to be in Blue Oyster Cult and, um, and, and to be a fan. And, and, I just, and I think the song Divine Wind live was just amazing. Like, that's the standout oh, yeah. track to me on this record now. There's a ton yeah. of great songs, but Divine Wind is like the classic to me. Um, yeah. You know, when you guys played that live on the line where it says, like, let's send them to hell and then the flames shoot down. It was, oh, my God, amazing. I love that. And, you know, and I just love the cover and all the humor behind it. Um, 
you know, the, the whole back showing, like, the dinosaur eggs. And it's just, the whole yeah. thing was just so perfectly thought out and executed, I thought. Yeah. How about you, Mr. Left? You know, it's like I was I was really nervous about this record after after Mirrors because I thought the band was, you know, was on a commercial track and there wasn't anything wrong with that. But I wasn't really sure about it. And, you know, I saw the album cover and I was really I remember the day I brought it home and I, um, you know, Black Blade, what a great way to start the album. I mean, just really talk about like return to form and like everything about Blue Oyster Cult is in that song. But then right after yeah. you have Monsters with that with that crazy jazz break in the middle. And I yeah. was like, this is a totally different thing this is really unexpected and every song is is really different but all in kind of encapsulated that all, all the things i love about the band plus i have the bonus of don kirshner's only on record appearance ever so <laughs> that was a oh wow i don't know that <laughs> don kirshner we were going to get paul schaefer to do his imitation and paul said to oh, Eric, perfect. no get don, don get don kirshner he loves doing those things <laughs> and it was great we were at uh, Electric Lady Studio just for the voiceover and uh, Don comes in with his assistant <laughs> I think he changed I think he changed clothes for the uh, for the recording no, yeah. was, he was he was a nice guy, really nice guy. You know, speaking of Don Kirscher, I got to say, funny. Joe, I was uh, you know a, a, a young teenager uh, back then when that came out in 1980, and my dad had just bought a brand new Betamax video recorders, and we were one of the cool. first on cool. the block to have the video recorders. And I I would just religiously scour every Sunday, check the schedule to see Don Kirschner and Midnight Special. Obviously, this is before MTV. And uh, yeah. I remember seeing Black Sabbath and Blue Oyster Cult. So I, of course, stayed up till one in the morning. I videotaped it and all my friends would come over to watch Black Sabbath and uh, Blue Oyster Cult. And he, I even had guys from bands like Slayer come to my house and watch that uh, Black uh, Sabbath and Blue Oyster Cult performance. But it was it was kind of funny. You had the band. Yeah, uh, that's that's that was sort of great. Now, of course, you can see all that stuff on YouTube. So all my yeah. old Betamax don't mean nothing. But <laughs> back then, it was it was so cool. The time it was great. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, anything else? Or should we move on to a uh, uh, fire of unknown origin? We can move sure. on. All right, uh, let's let's go do that. Uh, uh, July nineteen eighty one, of course, had, had the huge hit uh, "Burning for You," which was uh, probably your biggest uh, uh, radio song, I would imagine. Uh, Joe, why don't you uh, lead off on on that album? Uh, lots of fun being back in the studio with uh, Martin Martin Birch. I wish he had done more with us, but, you know, he had moved on to other projects. I think he was doing uh, uh, Iron Maiden, he did a bunch of a string of Iron Maiden records. Yeah. Uh, but that, yeah, uh, that, that one, we had been asked to do a soundtrack for the heavy metal movie and veteran of the psychic wars ended up on the soundtrack of the heavy metal movie, which is the third track on the album. I think I think there's a lot of good stuff. Joan Crawford, say no more. Great, yeah. Great wacky yeah. Uh, production. Don't turn your back. It's all good. Yeah. So, Joe, are you saying was so you're saying veteran of the psychic wars was recorded uh, before the rest of the record? Uh, no, I, I, we we molded some of these songs so that they could fit into an uh, to the movie. But what right, happened right. is. Uh, Hollywood uh, producers got in their their fingers in the pie, and they ended up putting people like uh, Stevie Nicks yeah. on the soundtrack and stuff like that. Don Felder, I guess. <laughs> yeah, Don Felder. Yeah, Which Jerry one? Riggs, my friend Jerry All had right. two songs. Oh, I love that Riggs song on that record. Right. Radar Rider yeah. or something. Yeah. So yeah. Hagar is on that album. And, yeah. And, yeah. So well, you know, Blue Oyster Cult got further down the list as far as you know even though we really thought that a lot of this stuff could be part of that album after dark you know vengeance is right out right. of the movie yeah to me it's followed like pretty organically from um cultosaurus maybe a little less heavier but like kind of right in the same vein um had a huge smash hit obviously burning yeah. for you and um yeah. Probably one of my favorite tracks also is Veteran of the Psychic Wars. Um to me yeah. I kind of feel the same way like I do about um what was the one we just said from Cultus Oh, it's kind of like it was kind of like this album's Divine Wind. 
in yeah. a way. Um, and yeah. it worked really well live. I was, yeah, I was completely satisfied with that record as a fan. I loved it as much as Cultosaurus, even if it was a little more commercial. Mm-hmm. It just yeah. felt great to me. And the timing was yeah. perfect for Burning For You, because that was right, that was the year MTV came into fold. And I remember yeah. seeing the Burning For You video all the time on MTV. That all was huge. All the time. Yeah. 12 times huge. a day. Yeah, that must have been a huge <laughs> wow. boost for the band. Hey, they didn't, well, they didn't have a lot of videos. Yeah. At first, true. They, they, yeah. they had to put on what they had, you know, and uh, they they liked that song and you know the power of the hit song well, too. It, let me ask it, you, um, Bob. You had meant you had referred to this at the start of this record as like the band's biggest hit. Well, I know that in re- you know like back through the ages now, of course, Reaper's their biggest song, but right. at the time. What, you know, was Burning For You the bigger, like a bigger hit at that time? It was like a number one Billboard track, wasn't it? Or it was like in the top three in yeah. Billboard, I think. Yeah, well, not quite that much. But, mm. you know, it's I get I talk to a lot of people that love that song a lot more than Reaper. I, I You know, which I can kind of see that because it's a great song. It's mm. just a great song. You know, I got to jump in and say, I, I know uh, this is going to sound blasphemous because so many people... For the purest Blue Oyster Cult fans that love the early tracks, but I gotta say, man, I think you guys write some of the best commercial hard rock songs. Your hits, not only Burning For You, but Take Me Away, one of my favorite songs. I believe, uh, didn't uh, Aldonova co-write that with you? Uh, yeah, yeah, with uh, with Eric, yeah, with Eric Bloom. Because you always, I mean, like a great track, a great track. That middle part, middle uh, lead part, yeah. and then it goes to this kind of jazzy fusion kind of. I mean, you always add like different kind of stuff to. It's very classy. It's not your typical cheesy songs. It's like you know, like Toto or, or bands like that. That really you a great musicianship, and you show the musicianship, but it's so catchy. You know, and and dancing in the runes is another one. I think, uh, you know, people. I, I always say those, those are some of my favorite BOC songs, Godzilla, including. I think, as far as writing catchy, hooky commercial rock songs, Blue Oyster Cult are one, one mm-hmm. of the top bands to do it. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, you know, even even when we were under pressure to do commercial stuff, we still wanted to have some 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 meat to it, some some real depth to the song. So, you know, it's not always easy to do that. And uh, yeah. we just got really lucky with a, a couple of these songs that, that you know, they're, it blows my mind how uh, yeah. the longevity of the whole catalog. And Andy. Also, though, Buck seemed to, you know, Buck had such a commercial voice. Like, you know, it's kind of no surprise that Buck sang the band's two biggest songs. It was just kind of the nature of his voice. Actually, that's what I want to ask you also, Joe. Was there ever any competition? Like, you know, I know Eric, Eric was a singer, singer too, too and, 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 but, but Joe, Joe, like, wound up getting most of the hits. Was there any kind of, uh, you know, competition between those guys, or it was just, like, yeah, all for one? Yeah, like, yeah, every, yeah we, we, if, for example, we had auditions for astronomy. Uh, Albert auditioned, I auditioned, and Eric auditioned. And I thought I did a great audition for astronomy. <laughs> But then Sandy said, no, we've decided. They went into a room and had a little conference. And they came out and said, no, we're, Albert's going to sing astronomy. I said, wow. okay, you know, I'm, I'm feeling strong about the song and I don't mind. Then we record the track and Eric sings the song. I said, what happened? Well, it just didn't work <laughs> out with Albert. <laughs> oh, wow. So, so it wasn't automatically like whoever wrote the song sang it? It was like not who could do it best? Not automatically. Not automatically. Albert wrote right. a lot of songs that he knew that he was going to have to play a difficult drum part. And also, right. it, it also depends. You could kind of imagine who would look best singing this on stage, you know? Right. Um, so it, it varied. It varied. There was There was a lot of reasons for making choices as we did right well i just love the variety i love that there were so many songwriters and and everybody sang something you know uh i just thought that was such an appealing aspect of the band always i love that too. you know that bands like black sabbath or deep purple or some of your peers didn't have it was just like you know one guy sang everything and that just made the band so (laughs) multi-faceted well wait bill ward actually does sing two black sabbath yeah it's it's all right right. which is pretty good and Look, and then I'm swinging the chain, which I don't think he sounds too good on swinging the chain, but he does well on. Uh, it's all right. 
<laughs> that was kind of their attempt at Beth. I'll look that up. I will look that up. Uh, Andy, what were your thoughts on this record? So, you know, it's the right record at the right time. It was just, you know, as Monty said, it just, it has it, 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 just like everything that you love about the band it had the hit single, had the heavy tune, had, you know, Joan Crawford, kind of the quirky, you know, you know, uh, supernatural thing. It's like, again, every yeah. kind of every element that one likes. And the production was great. It's like, for, for me, it's the best sounding uh, BOC album. I mean, Martin Birch really did a great job on it. It just sounds fantastic. It just jumps off the platter, you know? Mm. Now, so I had right a new album bass. at the right time. And my new music man bass really shines on that album. I, I wasn't really right. much of a, a, a technical guy about bass sounds, but I started, and, and also Martin Birch was a bass player himself. And mm. uh, I think he, he was very sensitive to that area of the Sonic, yeah. so... There's a great bass on fire. Yep. You know, the, the, son, the sonics of the record, the, p, the piano on Joan Crawford, the, um, just the, 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 the density of Veteran of the Psychic Wars, just, uh, just, mm -hmm. just such a great sounding album. And, and again, the variety on it is just amazing. Uh, yeah. So uh, let's just briefly go over Extraterrestrial Live, because I know uh, we've, we've uh, covered already two live albums. This was obviously your third live album, which was interesting <laughs> having three live albums within such a short amount of time within the 80s. Was that your choice or the label's choice to do a, a, a third mm. live album? I know it was during the Black and Blue tour, which obviously, as you mentioned, was a huge tour. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't remember what the, you know, but we knew that we were playing some of the songs better than we did on their studio recordings. And uh, we just wanted to capture that, that energy. Also, we knew that uh, if, we, if we had more time to work on the, the, the studio album after that, the uh, live albums tend to do that, where you, you get a little bit more time to work on your studio albums because the live album is out there. And it doesn't require as much intensive rehearsal. True. Uh, were there any comments either yeah. of you wanted to make, Monty or Andy, on this one? Well, or? oh, no, I love ETI on that record. Dr. Music, to me, is the definitive version. Um, yeah. I just, yeah, I remember liking everything about that record. And, of course, Rick Downey plays drums on it, right? So it was a little bit yeah. of a different take as well, having, like, I a think, different band member. Albert, Albert plays on two tracks, I believe. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. So there's a little bit of Albert and mostly Rick Downey, though. Was a very right. good player, and yeah, Bob. That was that wasn't the uh, Black and Blue tour. Black and Blue tour was Cultosaurus Erectus, right? So I don't yeah, think this, the, this was recorded on the Fire of Unknown Origin tour. Uh, right. oh, probably a little bit tour. of both. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, gotcha. So it's different different tours. Mm -hmm. All right. But yeah, no, I love that record. I thought it was. I was completely perfectly satisfied with it at the time, and I love the cover artwork too. Fantastic. Um, should we move on to uh, the Revolution by Night? Uh, which sure. was released in November of 1983. Why don't you uh, start that off, Joe? Um, I love this record. I thought I thought it didn't sell that well, and I think it, it may be a, another thing where timing and but it certainly had the material. We thought lots of uh, variety, but still some some edgy stuff. As you said, "Take Me Away." Love that song. It's a great track. Yeah. And uh, that's a great uh, song to lead off the album. Maybe they were looking for another Reaper at that time. And, you know, it's definitely Blue Oyster Cult uh, style. You know, it's, you probably should have done better. But uh, I, lo I love the record, Shadow of California. Mark, really yeah, that's a record. I got to revisit that record. I haven't heard it in so long that it's hard for me to really say much, except that, of course, I have Take Me Away stuck in my brain because it was a big favorite of mine at the time. And I know that I think Shooting Shark has kind of come down over the ages as like a classic from the record also. Yeah. Um, yep. But that's definitely a record I got to I, I need to revisit. It's hard for me to say much more than that. I, I haven't heard it in quite a while. But I remember liking it at the time, even though I felt it was more commercial, you know, like a step hey. back, you know, a step more commercial. I liked it at the yeah. time. I was satisfied this with it. This is a record that uh, you need to get Stephen Wilson to remix. 
Oh my God! Uh, yeah. There you go, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> make that Andy call, make Andy. That I actually make that call. Quick, 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 quick aside here. Um, I actually did approach Steve Shank. Uh, I don't know when was this? Maybe ten years ago or, or a while to see if he'd be interested in Stephen remixing Secret Treaties, um, which he oh. did not, which he did not warm to at the time. But I, I was doing that just for just for personal uh, reasons because I wanted to hear a five one version of it. Yeah. yeah, but I think Joe's right that this record would have been more appropriate for Steven. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, well, it's yeah. very heavily produced. You know, this is a Bruce Fairbairn album, right? So there's a lot of, you know, there's yeah. a lot of production already in there. Yeah. Bruce had to leave before the end of the album, so he didn't really mix it. And we probably made a mistake because we we should have recorded it uh, where, where he did all the hits up in uh, Vancouver. I think he was a little out of his element and was a little unsure, uh, you know, what to do. And eventually Sandy Perlman and Donald Roser uh, mixed the album. It was just a little disjointed in, in, in that way. Uh, it might have been better if it was, you know, uh, a different direction happened. But, you know, those things happen. And they certainly spent a lot of time on it. You know, a lot of detail work, but... Uh, uh, see if uh, Stephen Wilson's available. <laughs> <laughs> Make it happen, Andy. Hey, Joe, I had read something else that the back cover of the record was originally the was what you guys envisioned for the front. Do you remember anything about that? I don't remember. Yeah, I think it was that Martin Popoff did a artwork book, and I think he I think that's where I got that from. That the back cover was originally the front, but yeah, I thought I just thought as even as the artwork on that record, something about it just wasn't. It just wasn't as creative. The band always had such awesome, memorable, creative album covers. Yeah. And I thought that that one just felt a little plain to me. Compared yeah, that's to a Greg the other. Scott cover. And he, Greg's a great artist. He did the uh, Burn It For You cover. Um, yeah, um, and he did ETI live. The, uh, yeah. the, I thought that yeah. live record cover oh, was amazing. Yeah. yeah, he's a great artist. One of the best. Too. You know, I don't know. I don't know. Hey, I yeah. guess that's one I have to do a, a, a Facebook post on and figure it out. So now <laughs> yeah. I got my homework yeah. out of me. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Cool. Let's uh, move on to uh, Club Ninja, uh, released December of 1985. Uh, Joe, your uh, memories of that album? Well, this is one of the reasons I left the band, mm. uh, must say. It, it was a very expensive record. Oh, man. I, I don't even want to. I don't even want to come up with how much money we spent on this. And I was very disappointed, you know, after, after I looked at the, how much we spent and, and what we got. Uh, Perfect Water is great. You know, Dance of the Ruins is great. Oh, I love I that. Like white, yeah. I love, I really like White Flags. I don't know why it, did, you know, become more popular. I wrote a song with Sandy called When the War Comes, which is uh, going to be part of, uh, I think, Imaginos. Shadow Warriors, Good Manage the Method, another epic uh, Blue Oyster Cult style. But you know, I was, I was, it, I can't say it was just this record, but it was definitely, you know, the the sort of relentless touring that we were doing. I felt it was time to make a change and do some solo albums. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. What do you guys think? Um, you know, that's another record that I probably need to revisit because it's been many years, but I really like those uh, couple of songs you mentioned, Joe. I think Perfect Water, yeah. Dancing in the Runes. So I think it had a few good tracks, but like, yeah, overall, yeah, I just, it wasn't my BOC. I thought it was significantly lesser than uh, Revolution by Night. That's kind of where the band lost me. I don't even know if I bought that record. I, I don't even think I own that record. I mean, I got that like in the re CD reissue era, but I think at the time it came out, I don't remember even owning it. Well, the, here's how... At the, time, at the time it came out, it wasn't even really promoted that much because I don't even remember it, it coming out at the time. I think I only heard it after the fact, maybe by a, a few years, and I hadn't listened to it in so long until the box set came out. But yeah, it, it wasn't my Blue Oyster cult either. And I, I, I got the sense at that time, too, that it was more like band like committee at that point. There were a lot of outside writers. Yeah. There were a lot of extra musicians. You know, Albert was gone. Alan was gone. Yeah. I think that was, who was it? It was Tommy Zvoncek, I think, did keyboards. And was yeah. it um, uh, Kenny Tommy, uh, yeah. yeah, and Tommy Price played drums. 
Um, right, and there was a lot, a lot of outside writers on that too. So it, it seemed to me it was more like a album by committee rather than the core, you know, the core band. Something was definitely missing. Yeah, I, I felt is, like uh, yeah. I, I, what I really missed was the like when back in the early days of the band. I know nothing lasts forever, but that core, that writing, creative core that we had in the beginning had completely, you know gone in different directions by this time you know i don't know was that the label or the producer because i know at that time that was when outside songwriters were hot you know to get that radio hit well, right um donald and sandy did most of the production on this i wish you know but it would have been totally different if martin birch was doing it but he was on to other projects at that time i don't know it's what it is we we did two this is how excessive it was we had two different mixes we had an american mix and we had a european mix then so the album was mixed twice i don't know uh i sonically i couldn't tell you the difference between the two mixes but it certainly was an expensive uh proposition yeah you know how we were saying before how like you know as adults we reappraise a record like mirrors and we can appreciate it i I haven't reappraised this record in a while, but I have a feeling if I do, I'm still going to feel the same way. Like, I'm not, you know what I mean? There's just something missing about the record, and even on the songcraft side. Like, I don't know, something's, something was off on this one. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, they, they, they followed it up with the Maginos after that. Now, you and, actually played uh, keyboards on that record I'm reading here. Uh, so, you know, were you, was that like as a session think- or? That was even more expensive than than, than Club Ninja. Oh wow! Huge, <laughs> expensive record. My actually my con- contributions to the the record. I think maybe I sang a couple of background vocals and maybe played a couple of piano parts. They were probably replaced because it was another one of those things that had you know a zillion different players. So to be honest, I don't know what was kept for Imaginos. But they put my name on the album. I'll take it. There you go. In astronomy, <laughs> yeah. In astronomy, yeah. And that that is, it's a different version, yeah. not as liked as the original version. Sure. But it's uh, it's still a, a great song. Donald sings great, you know. But uh, it's a weird weird arrangement. Yeah, I'm looking at the credits here now. They've got so many musicians. Uh, Kenny oh, Aronson. I, I credit too. I see 13. 13 a, uh, Robbie Krieger. <laughs> like one of those movies with a cast of thousands. Yeah. Well, should we, a uh, uh, brief, I, I know we've gone on for quite some time now. Uh, I definitely want to talk. Uh, was there any other stuff uh, before we get onto your solo work and your new solo project you have coming out? I definitely want to talk about that a little bit before we end. Was there anything else, uh, BOC wise, uh, any of you guys wanted to comment on? I think we're, it's pretty good. We've covered a lot. Yeah, I think we're good. Anything Why don't we you talk guys about, uh, No, I'm good on my end. Anything for you, Andy? Okay. No, no, I'm good. I'm wanting, I want to hear about Joe's new new project. Yes, okay. Strange Legends coming out uh, later yeah. this month. Let's talk yeah. about that, Joe. Uh, it's a good rocking record. I had a lot of fun making this record. It's my sixth solo album. So I think that as a producer, I'm getting better. Um it's a self-produced album, so you have to wear two hats. You have to be the, the artist, and then you have to be the guy to criticize the artist. So I end up talking to myself a lot, you know, when I'm, <laughs> when I'm doing... I, I think the, the songs are really strong. Some of the style, not all of it, but some of the style, would you would say, oh, this could be Blue Oyster Cult, you know, sounds like a Blue Oyster Cult. And I've tried to, to do other things, but I think it's, it's sort of in my nature just because I we I was part of the the beginning of uh, of of the Blue Oyster Cult, but it's just what I do naturally, you know. I don't know. Have you guys heard it yet? No, I haven't. Uh, I don't know if they uh, sent out any uh, advances of this yet, but I'm dying to hear it. Well, uh, definitely uh, check it out because they do have a uh, a uh, review version that you can go to a website and hear all the stuff you put in a password. Oh, yeah, yeah. We know, um, we both know your publicist, um, uh, Chip. Chip, Chip so, Rizier, yeah. yeah. Could, yeah. I, could get a link, I could get Chip to send links. Mm. He's doing a fantastic job. Chip's the best. Oh, we love Chip. Yeah, Chip is, yeah I guess he was, you know, set this thing up with Bob. But, yeah, yeah, Chip is a great guy. We've used him at Nuclear Blast as an indie PR. 
on some projects. And yeah, he's really the guys. A, the guys a dynamo. We love guys. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm really amazed. Uh, so the songs are fun. It really rocks hard. I got Mickey Curry to play drums. Mickey is played on uh, Brian Adams, right? Brian Adams. Brian yeah. Adams. Alice Cooper. Uh, the Cult. Wow. Sonic Temple. Great sounding album. Oh yeah. Uh, it was really great to work with in the studio, and it makes the job of the producer so much easier because you know every part is just really supportive. But he doesn't overplay. Doesn't you know? He just puts it where it should be. I think this is going to be a really good selling album. It's um, already Joe. What really label well. is it? On? It's on your own label, right? Rock Heart Records. Yes, uh, you and your brother, right, started, Albert? Yes, we have started a label. Uh, we signed with huh. a manager, this guy Jeff Keller from California. And the first thing that Jeff said when you know he said, "You guys should have your own record label." And we never thought of that, you know. And he wait, said, is this? Sorry, is this Jeff Keller who used to manage Laz Rocket back in the day? No, that's uh, oh, Jeff. Maybe. That's Jeff Weller. This is Jeff oh, Keller shit, with a okay. K. <laughs> <laughs> I had a wrong letter. Never yeah. mind. He, he, he manages uh, a bunch of Doro Pesh from, um, from Germany. Germany and uh, also Famous Brothers, uh, Carmine and, and Vinny, Vinny ah. Apathy. Right. Oh. Famous brothers. So I guess he he was looking for more famous brothers. <laughs> right. And um, uh, wait, what's the release date for this record, Joe? Uh, July thirty first on Rock Heart Records. And we wanted to be able to like promote the idea that uh, even though we are veterans of the business, we are still as excited as the when we did our first albums and. Uh, very creative too. Albert Scunduy Reimaginos is his album that'll be out in October. So uh, I know that fans are going to love that album. I've heard most of it, and it really is a fantastic album. Sounds great. Of course, it's got great material. Albert really wanted to do something that would really make Sandy feel proud. You know, a lot of the ideas that they wanted to do with the first Imaginos. Uh, Albert has dug out of the dug out of the archives, and uh, so that's going to be that's going to be great. So mine is the first album on Rock Heart Records, and his will be the second. And we plan right. to do several things after that. So we'll be talking to you guys. Absolutely, yeah, I can't wait to hear it. We, right. And will these uh, yeah, you got will too. this stuff be for sale on Amazon? Yeah, it's okay. on, yeah, it'll be on Amazon. Yeah. And, uh, you know, all the streaming services. The first single is called Forget About Love. Been out for a couple of weeks. I got another single coming out next week called She's a Legend with John Shirley uh, on lyrics. You probably know John from his work with uh, science fiction books, but he also writes lyrics for Blue Oyster Cult. Mm. So he gladly sent me some lyrics that uh, they had passed on, (laughs) but they were great. So I'm, yeah, I I love working with John Shirley, mm. and uh, yeah, he he wrote uh, for the last two studio albums that Eric and Donald have done. There's a lot of John Shirley, and he's a really creative guy. Maybe there's another Reaper in there, or a Burning for You. I don't know, but wow. I'm I'm very happy with what I've done with this. Uh, That's great. There, That's great. Yeah. What is Deco Entertainment? Is, is that John Keller's company? Uh, you know, I'm not sure. Okay. It's uh, the guys from, um, well, they have a lot of legacy artists. Singer from Survivor, Dave Bickler. And they're really excited about, you know, uh, my, myself and my brother's projects. Uh, we have total artistic control, so we can't blame them <laughs> for telling us what to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's a great situation. Well, before They have great reach all over the world. Oh, I was just going to say, before we end this off, uh, did you want to give out any, is there any websites you mentioned that they could pick it up on Amazon? Uh, is there any, if, if, for people to pick up on physical CD or anything, do you have a, a website or social media pages people could go to? Yes, uh, my website is com, and you can find links to everything there. All the recordings, I have a couple of vinyls. You have some great um, merchandise, I saw. Yeah. And they're, they're 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 putting out a mega bundle with my new album, and it's really great. Uh, you get picks 
hats and posters and T-shirts. I haven't even seen the T-shirt, but uh, it's it's all good, and I'm really excited about it. Great art. I have a young artist. He just graduated from high school. Great artist. Very creative. You know, a lot of surreal fantasy, but with a contemporary theme. It's really, really great. You know, I want to ask you, Joe, was there any talk about doing a documentary on Blue Oyster Cult? Because the band has such a great history, and there's so many, you know, documentaries coming out on on bands. And, you know, I I was introduced to some guy, and I can't remember his name, uh, here in L.A., and he had showed me a bunch of old film footage. He was a friend of the band, grew up with the band. He had all this old film footage. Bola Gregmar. Is that Bola? What? Bola? Yes. Mm-hmm. Bola? The, yeah. That, Bola. I think he lives I, in L.A. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he was the head of the Blue Oyster Cult fan club for decades. Great friend, great fan. He's got a lot, a lot of stuff. He's got the archive. But, yeah, that would be a great idea. Yeah. I would, I would, well, I would love to. I, I, You know, I don't know how it would work out. I'm planning to uh, write a book uh, mm. about my experiences with the band. There's there's a few books out now. There's a book in French, and uh, I expect some more things coming out. It was a long time where Blue Oyster Cult seemed to be under the radar about those kind of things, but maybe our time is coming, you know? Sure. It would be great. Hey, Bob, you should mention the movie idea to Martin Popoff, because Martin is part of the Banger film. Yeah, family, exactly. And he knows all of yeah. and- They'd be the perfect people to do it. I think I actually did talk oh. to Sam Dunn about that. But usually they have the production companies come to them with with the budget, you know, like when they did the Alice yeah. Cooper and the CZ yeah. Top. So, you know, that's the other thing. They'd have to have a, you know. They did a Rush, uh, Rush documentary, They did a right? fantastic one yeah. on Rush. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. do great work. He does great work. He oh, would be perfect yeah, to yeah. do something on you, yeah. My number is. <laughs> <laughs> Go to my website. There's a contact button. It's open 24 hours a day. Well, Martin will definitely be listening to this podcast so he'll get wind of it (laughs) i just talked i just talked to him earlier in the week oh nice he's a great great guy oh we love martin we love love martin absolutely one of our best friends here (laughs) all right well let's uh i guess in closing definitely check out uh uh, uh, joe bouchard at joe bouchard.com j-o-e-b-o-u-c-h-a-r-d and check out the merchandise and definitely check out the new record, Strange Legends, coming out uh, July 31st on his imprint label, uh, him and um, Albert's imprint label, uh, Rock Heart Records. Uh, great cast, man. Once again, just thank you so much for participating in this, Joe. I know uh, well, we took a lot great, of your time uh, doing this. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Absolutely. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, this was really, really good. Um, to spend, spend two, two hours, hours on the phone with one of your childhood, childhood heroes, heroes is like, like this. I, mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, I would have never believed when I was 15 years old that I would be doing this one day. But, um, Joe, you're a legend, and uh, thank you for all the amazing music over the years and for sharing all your insights and humoring us by letting us give hours. And uh, oh. it's just really fun. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Great, great talk. Let's do it again. Thank you. Joe. Absolutely. Thank when you. When the movie comes out. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. We'll have this posted next week. I'll send you all a link. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank Take you care. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to the Shockwave Skull Sessions podcast. Subscribe and listen to all episodes by going to our pages on iTunes, Spreaker, YouTube, Spotify, and more. You can listen to all other episodes and access up-to-date information and news on the Shockwave Skull Sessions podcast by going to our website at www.shockwaveskullsessions.com. Email all comments, questions, and suggestions to shockwaveskullsessions at gmail.com.